Hey everyone, in this lecture we're going to talk about exercise and the environment. Uh, and so this will be cover similar things with heat and cold that we've talked about before, uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about those. And so where we're going to start off with is we're going to talk about altitude uh, and how altitude affects exercise. And so when you go up in altitude, so think about um, base level when we talk about altitude is sea level, so you're at the sea level. And then anything above that, we start going up in altitude. And then um, at, as you get higher and higher, things start to change uh, to a greater extent. And so um, atmospheric pressure is the greatest thing that affects at altitude. And that's because as you go up in altitude, you decrease uh, atmospheric pressure. There's less pressure pushing uh, air particles together and pushing on you. Um, and so this changes the partial pressures. Remember, they're... Um, that partial pressures are related to the overall atmospheric pressure and so if the total atmospheric pressure goes down so do the partial pressures and that's driving oxygen into our blood and CO2 out of our blood and so um, the concentration stays the same as you go up in altitude the percentage of oxygen is still around 20 percent but that pressure pushing into the body gets lower um, and so that's going to cause less oxygen into our body less oxygen to our muscles and can cause issues especially as the altitude gets greater and greater. Uh, so at altitude, the biggest thing you're worried about is what's called hypoxia, which is where you have a low uh, PO2, so a low amount of uh, O2 in the blood. Sea level, you get uh, normoxia, which is a normal level of PO2, and then hyperoxia is a high level of PO2. So typically this happens in, uh, when you get below sea level uh, in like things like Death Valley or if you're scuba diving. Uh, and so how does, how does altitude affect performance? Well, at a short-term anaerobic exercise, there's not uh, too much of an effect on overall performance. Uh, O2 transport to the muscle doesn't, isn't the limiting of performance at your anaerobic systems. They're not really reliant on that O2. It may take you a little longer to recover, but nothing affecting the performance itself. Uh, but the lower air resistance, because the pressure isn't as great, may actually improve some performance slightly, but may actually improve performance. Long-term aerobic performance um, with that lower PO2 results in usually worse performance. Um, and that's because longer-term aerobic, aerobic exercise is more dependent on that O2. And if you can't transport it as easily, um, your muscles will suffer. And so this can actually be seen uh, with Olympic performances. So Olympic are your elite top-level athletes. So usually um, you can see kind of similar results Olympics after Olympics, you'll see some changes. Um, but in um, the 64 to 68 Olympics, you wouldn't see, you wouldn't expect to see too much of a, an improvement. You might see a few records change, but you wouldn't see this overall drastic change in all exercises, good and bad. Um, and so in 1964, we had the Tokyo Olympics, which um, are at basically sea level. Uh, and then in 1968, they were in Mexico City, which is at some pretty high altitude. If you don't know, Mexico City is actually on a plateau. Uh, and so this causes this increase in altitude. And so you actually see performance changes. So in your short races, men and women, what you see is a, um, a decrease in time. So if you see like 10 to, to 9.1, and it's talking about a percentage change from 64 to 68, and so there's this 1%, 2% uh, decrease in time across these shorter events, and some don't have any. So we see this very slight improvement. But when we go to our longer events, like uh, 5Ks, so three miles, your marathons, things like that, you see 1,500 still may not be affected. That's, that's still kind of anaerobic at the time frames they're looking at. You're just starting to get into aerobic. But as you get into your longer, greater than about getting to that 10-minute mark and greater, uh, you start to see that decrease right and notice that the walk isn't as affected as much as the marathon where they're running and so you can see that longer the time the greater it's going to have that change uh, surely because of the less oxygen they're getting to their muscles so one thing to note is we talked about in performance maybe in anaerobic things uh, increasing because of that decreased air resistance which we looked at and so jumping through the air is going to look a little bit different so when it comes to um, the long jump world record was set in um, in the uh, Mexico City games. And so lower air density at the higher altitude probably played some part. But when we calculated it out, uh, there was only a 2.4 centimeter gain. So that's about an inch. Uh, 
but that inch could mean a big difference in world records, especially at the elite level. So what we do know is that as you go up in altitude, um, the effects that we see from this uh, reduction in um, the reduction in this pressure uh, is kind of greater as you go up. And so we can see this decrease in VO2 max at higher and higher altitudes. And so you see a 12% loss at around 2,400 meters, 20%, 3,100, and then 4,000 you'll see over a quarter uh, loss in your VO2. And these are like maximum tests. So um, when, you're, when we're looking at this uh, up to moderate altitude, so moderate altitude is considered approximately up to 4,000 meters. Anything over that is going to be considered high altitudes. Um, the main reason you see this VO2 max decreasing is because of that partial pressure of oxygen, the lower pressure pushing oxygen into the blood getting lower. At higher elevation, so when you start climbing mountains like Mount Everest, uh, VO2 max reduction is also due to um, cardiac output not keeping up. So there's a decrease in maximal heart rate at higher altitudes. And so this can be seen here um, that your percent of maximal aerobic power, so at 100% at sea level, goes down the higher we get up, kind of on a linear trend. Um, and we get into some pretty high elevations when you start talking about Peru, uh, Colorado, you had Leadville, Colorado, which is kind of where Olympics go, Olympic athletes go sometimes to train. And so um, with altitude on submaximal exercise, uh, you'll get a higher heart rate. So if we're not talking about max exercise, we're talking about just kind of normal submax exercise, maybe even training levels, um, you still get a higher heart rate, even at the submax level, because your heart's having to move more blood to move the same amount of oxygen as it did at sea level. Um, and so you're also going to require higher ventilation at the same level, because you're having to move more air to get the same amount of oxygen molecules. Because again, think that pressure isn't as high. Uh, and so you can kind of see here how heart rate is affected. Um, at different levels of oxygen consumption at sea level, and you see that everything is higher, but they still follow a similar trend, so it just shifts it up. Uh, and we can also see that with ventilation and how much greater ventilation comes at higher altitudes, especially at higher levels of intensity. And it's taking more and more to keep up with that demand. So the cool thing is, is that with altitude, we can acclimatize to this. We can actually acclimatize to high altitude. And so the way that we get used to high altitude so that our bodies can perform better is we produce more red blood cells. So if we have trouble, we're not getting as much oxygen in because the partial pressure isn't pushing oxygen onto all of our red blood cells. Well, if we make more red blood cells, then we can carry more of them. So it's going to create this bigger differential on pressures and more will stick to that hemoglobin. Um, and so this is done through what's called uh, erythropoietin or EPO. So this is sometimes used as performance enhancing drug. Um, and so this counters that, satur that, that low PO2, that desaturation. Uh, this is the primary um, adaptation um, among Andy resident, Andean residents. So people that live in the Andes mountains. Um, so greater oxygen saturation due to that um, is another thing that we see. So uh, due to the increases in blood flow to the lungs, this res results in increases in release of nitric oxide. So um, basically the, the chemicals that are helping that oxygen saturation um, and what it takes to get that oxygen to bind. So we're going to increase blood flow to the lungs so that you're picking up more of that oxygen onto the red blood cells you have. So you see more red blood cells and basically we're, we're going to change the body so that more of that oxygen sticks to those red blood cells. Um, and so this particular adaptation, greater oxygen saturation, is what you see in Himalayan shepherds. So uh, these Sherpas uh, in the Himalayas help people that climb Mount Everest get all their gear up. Uh, because most people aren't acclimatized to it, these guys are, and can literally go up and down Mount Everest with ease without needing a lot of um, additional equipment or having to, to try to get used to it. And so um, this is the main thing we see with them. We also see that uh, residents that uh, have their lifetime at altitude, so think if you were born at altitude, so you were born in the Himalayan mountains uh, and you lived there most of your life, they see slightly different adaptations than someone who uh, 
goes there later on in life. Uh, and so they have a complete, um, have complete arterial O2 uh, content, uh, have about as much as they can. Their VO2 max adaptations also change. And so we really don't see mu too much of a difference um, with them that have lived their entire lives at altitude. Uh, but these adaptations aren't as complete in those arriving later on in life. Even if they lived there for a long time, they're not as complete as someone who lived there their entire life. Um, and so the way this works is that uh, when you have decreased blood oxygen, the kidney sends this, and they release EPO or erythropoietin, which stimulates the bone marrow to generate more red blood cells. And so this is not a process that happens overnight. It actually takes uh, several weeks um, for this to kind of all catch up. And so it's not like you're going to go up for a couple days and see benefits from being at altitude. It's going to have to be extended periods of time. So what happens um, if you're training for competition at altitude? Like, well, what's going on there? Um, well, the effect of training at altitude on VO2 max varies among people. Uh, some, some do well, some don't have much of a response. Um, some athletes can improve by training at altitudes where others can't. It's these individual differences on, on what their bodies can do and what maybe their bodies are already doing uh, before they arrive at altitude. Um, and so kind of the bigger, the, maybe the greater sea level and not as trained are going to see different effects than someone who's highly trained and, and more above sea level. Um, so when it comes back, if you've tr trained and at altitude for a while, when you come back down to sea level, would we see a higher VO2? Again, that depends. Some do, some do not. Um, part of it is, is that you may not see a higher VO2 after returning back to, um, uh, to sea level because of detraining. So when you're at altitude, you cannot train as hard, right? You can't get your VO2 as high. Um, you can't train at as high of a level of VO2. Your muscles are being stressed, but not in the same way. And so you may not actually see that increase in VO2 like some people would hope because of the training. So there's this thought out there that the best way maybe to see the adaptations and still uh, compete at a high level is to live at a high altitude and then train at a low altitude. Uh, and so when you live at a high altitude, this is going to elicit those increases in red blood cells with the EPO, which increases the increased VO2 because you can carry more oxygen. Um, typically, when you think about living at altitude, uh, we're talking about you have to spend 22 hours per day at 2,000 to 2,500 meters, um, or you can simulate this uh, for a shorter period of time. So they have bags that you can uh, literally stay in. They're called hyperbaric chambers, uh, or sorry, hypobaric chambers, um, and you get in and they decrease the pressure uh, simulating altitude. Uh, and so you spend 12 to 16 hours at maybe 2,500 to 3,000 during the day, even though you're living at sea level. Uh, and then there's some examples of people doing it, you know, intermittently. So doing a couple times, going to a really extreme altitude and doing it a few times a week for a few hours each day um, to try to elicit these same effects. And so you're kind of living in altitude or simulating that in different ways. And then you train. Every time you train, you're going to go out into regular kind of conditions where you're living at now, so not too far above sea level or at sea level. So you can train at a very high level. You're getting enough oxygen to push yourself to those high levels of VO2 max. And so does this increase performance at sea level? Does it help? Some athletes it does. Some athletes it doesn't. Um, we see less of an impact on elite athletes. Um, than we do people who are just normal training. So your elite athletes may not see much of that increase because they're already about as high as their body can go. Um, and being able to carry more O2 isn't the issue. It's more of the you processing it at the cellular level. Um, so some studies have shown that increase in performance with um, red blood cell mass, with intermittent hypoxia. Um, and so the thought behind that is, is that if someone has, sorry, said that wrong, some studies have shown an improvement in VO2 max without the increase in red blood cells. So they don't increase the amount of red blood cells, but they still see an improvement in VO2 max with that intermittent hypoxia, so simulating altitude. And so the thought behind that is you improve your mitochondrial function so they can just pull oxygen easier and you increase your buffering capacities. But it's still not fully um, accepted or understood. And so there, there is a reverse where you kind of live at a low altitude and train at a high altitude. Um, there are some potential negative effects for prolonged altitude exposure. 
um, on just blood pressure and, and other things to do with your blood. Think about all those changes that are happening. Um, but you're not really seeing any changes in your VO2 max, your hemoglobin. You're just going up to altitude and, and decreasing that partial pressure. Uh, so not really seeing much of any kind of helpful this. This is actually probably maybe even going to hurt your performance because you can't train at a high level. Um, so one of the things that uh, is always good in these kind of scenarios is to look at the extremes and what goes on and what may be possible for the human body. And so one example of this is um, Mount Everest. The Mount Everest is the highest place that we can climb. We can go and exercise. And so Mount Everest was first successfully climbed in... Uh, 1953 and they used supplemental oxygen they actually take oxygen up there and breathe that in at altitude because it makes exercise easier we're forcing more oxygen in for the muscles to utilize um, and so people thought it wasn't actually possible to climb Everest without oxygen but in 1978 um, someone actually did that um, and the reason they thought they couldn't is because uh, they thought that you wouldn't be above rest you wouldn't get enough oxygen to be above 3.5 milliliters per kilogram, but it actually you can get up to 15 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram uh, per minute, so 15 uh, ml kgs per minute VO2. Uh, and they just kind of miscalculated when they did that example. So you can see where the, so the summit of Everest is and the highest people climbed in different years and then eventually hitting Everest with oxygen and then a few years later someone actually doing it without. Um, but you can see how uh, these different things are affecting um, between sea level and Mount Everest and maximal oxygen uptake and that inspired VO2 and how that's changing. And you just can't achieve a high level when you're at these low VO2s. So challenges with high altitude climbing, if we're thinking about it, is um, you have to have, so successful climbers have to be able to ventilate. They have to be able to hyperventilate to get rid of more CO2 because hydrogen is building up because your lactic acid, lactate, your glycolysis is having to work harder because you can't get as much oxygen for PO2 and so lactate builds up. Um, and so they actually see an increase in uh, their alveoli over time to uh, inspire more O2 but also um, to get rid of more CO2. Additionally, you'll see uh, climbers will contend with weight loss, um, a loss of appetite, so they get weight loss. Uh, their muscle fibers decrease because they're just not able to get oxygen to keep them alive. And so um, there is this thing what called the lactate paradox. Um, and what it's talking about is upon exposure to altitude uh, with higher heart rates and ventilation and lactate, lactate building up during exercise, um, is happening because of hypoxia, but after you acclimatize, uh, there's a lactate reduction. So basically, we don't build up as much lactate, um, despite the fact all these other things continue. They're not really sure the cause. There are some guesses of that, um, but it's actually not uh, fully accepted, and most people, there are lots of people who don't even think it exists because not everyone sees this phenomenon, uh, but it is something to consider. Uh, and so that's kind of looking at altitude and, and what's going on. And so we should be able to start linking some of these things we're talking about. Um, so then we move into the heat, which we've already talked about. With the heat, the biggest thing we're worried about is hyperthermia, so getting the body temperature too high. And so there are problems that come along with hypothermia, um, like heat syncope, so when you get too hot and you kind of get dizzy and disoriented, and heat cramps, so uh, muscles getting too hot and then not working properly. Um, but these also lead to things in a more severe, so these are kind of your not as, not as bad problems with hyperthermia, but as that temperature continues to increase, we get things like heat exhaustion and then eventually heat stroke, and these can require medical attention and be very dangerous for the body. When it comes to heat, the greatest thing you can do to, with someone who is too hot um, is to simply uh, dunk them in cold water, um, and that's going to lower their core temperature quickly and stop this... Um, denaturing of proteins that occurs when your body gets too warm. Uh, so when we go with that, so this is a good chart to kind of look at. What it talks about is the different heat-related illnesses that occur, kind of what's going on. So uh, muscle cramps is your your first level, like it's the first thing that's going to happen. It doesn't happen in everyone, but physical cramping, uh, as soon as you stop exercise and rehydrate, uh, even ice the muscle, those go away. 
key syncope, you start getting dizzy, um, brief episodes, maybe fainting, dizziness, tunnel vision. Typically, again, we stop exercise, start cooling down, rehydrate. We see those symptoms go away. Then we start getting into some more severe things like heat exhaustion, so confusion, disorientation. Um, your body's not able to keep up with all the demand put on it. And so this is where we start getting uh, important to get someone cool as quickly as possible. So um, cool towels, um, ice, uh, getting clothes off that, that are going to keep heat in, uh, getting them out of the heat. And so heat exhaustion may require medical attention, uh, but very quickly heat exhaustion turns into um, heat stroke. And this is where your body temperature gets above 40.5 degrees Celsius. Um, and innate proteins in your body literally start coming apart and not functioning correctly. You can see someone with heat stroke actually shivering, even though they're very hot, because the brain's getting confused about what's going on. And this is where we definitely want to dunk them into a, a ice water bath, uh, try to get water moving across them to cool their body temperature down very quickly. Uh, and if someone ever has heat stroke, they definitely need to go get medical attention because the long-term side effects can, can last uh, and need to be treated immediately to try to uh, kind of blunt the effect they're going to have. So when it comes to heat injury, uh, kind of the things we're talking about here, uh, those with higher fitness levels actually tend to be less at risk. Uh, they tolerate heat better, they, they acclimatize faster, they sweat more, uh, but they still have a risk. It's just a little less likely to happen. They have mechanisms that, that kind of protect them. Um, and so the biggest thing we have for heat injury that we've talked about before is acclimatization to the heat. So getting used to the heat, getting our body and physiology to kind of adjust to that. Typically takes between 10 and 14 days to start seeing those benefits build up. And so um, when that's occurring, you want to start um, at low intensities, uh, try to avoid long durations, and slowly build up uh, to those. Uh, and then slowly increase intensity to shorter durations until you can go to a greater intensity for a longer time. The adaptations you see uh, that occur during this time frame are increased plasma volume to, so you can sweat more, uh, increased VO2 max um, for, for maximal cardiac output. So, um, and so you see these improvements in performance because you're having more blood volume and you can get to a higher VO2 max because you have more cardiac output. Uh, but you're also able to keep your body temperature lower um, and your heart rate won't be as high during the heat. Um, and the coolest thing is we also lose less salt so that we keep our um, minerals balanced. So our, our salt, our sweat is less salty as we become acclimatized. Um, and so this acclimatization is actually the best way to prevent heat stroke and heat exhaustion uh, because the body makes so many changes to prevent those from occurring. Um, with that being said, though, again, you're not fully safe even if you've acclimatized. So there are things you want to kind of keep in mind to help prevent those. One is to hydrate. Um, make sure that you, you're always drinking water before, during, after. Um, getting electrolytes um, can be helpful if you're out there for a really long time and haven't eaten. But most of the time, you don't need things like energy drinks and electrolyte supplements. Um, water typically is, is good for that. Also, you have to keep in mind the, the environmental temperatures, uh, things like humidity and the sun is out or is it cloudy and the actual temperature outside uh, may result in you building up heat in your body quicker than other times. And so we have to take uh, the environment into account. Clothing is a big issue as well. You, when it's hot and humid and you're working out in the heat, exposing more skin to the air um, allows you to evaporate your sweat more readily and get rid of heat. So being fully covered, even though sun protection is, is there, if you're out in the sun, it may cause your heat to go up quicker and put you more risk for heat injury. Uh, so you may wanna use something, if you are covering up your skin, something that wicks away sweat from the skin. So some of that moisture wicking technology that's out there. Uh, humidity plays the biggest role. Uh, the more water vapor that's in the air, the harder it is for our sweat to evaporate. And during exercise, the main way we keep ourselves cool is through sweat evaporation. And so relative humidity is a good way to kind of look um, at that water vapor pressure. Um, again, the higher intensity work rate that we do. So uh, the higher exercise we do, the higher our work rate is, the more likely we are to see heat injury because we're producing more heat. Um, and then the wind can play a role. 
if the wind is cool, it can actually help us to not be susceptible to heat injury. But if you've ever had like a hot wind blow across you, it can actually increase your body temperature um, and make us more likely uh, for that to happen. And so you can see all the different things that play into heat injury. Uh, and so you have to take all these things into account as you're exercising in the heat. Um, realize that um, different types of uniforms and the clothing you can wear affect uh, your overall temperature, not only during exercise, you'll see a higher increase, but you'll also see during recovery it takes longer to cool down depending on whether you're wearing shorts or a full uniform or something in between. Um, and so when it comes to that, there are some different um, suggestions to kind of help you avoid heat-related injuries that we've already kind of mentioned, but knowing the signs and symptoms of heat illness uh, like cramps, lightheadedness, so that you can slow down your activity or stop activity if those happen before it becomes a bigger problem are important. Uh, we always say exercise in the first thing in the morning or late in the evening when it's cooler. Gradually increase your exposure to heat and humidity so you can <coughs> acclimatize. Um, also, uh, drink water before, during, and after exercise, which we already kind of mentioned. Uh, wearing lighter clothes so you don't absorb as much of the radiation from the sun. Um, we all know that white clothes aren't as hot as black clothes, uh, so things like that. Uh, make sure you monitor your heart rate during exercise um, and stay in a target heart rate zone. So if your heart rate starts to creep up, even though your intensity hasn't, uh, you'll want to decrease that, intemp that intensity so you can keep your body at a constant body temperature and it won't continue to increase as you exercise. Um, and then it's really important for conditioning before you exercise. You don't want to just jump in uh, to a hot, humid environment where you're not ready for exercise and you're not acclimatized to that heat. Um, again, try to move things that you do outdoor to cooler seasons, but that's not always possible. Like uh, football in high schools always starts in the summer. So do things like frequent water breaks, um, and then always keep an eye out for people with heat-related illnesses. Have things on hand like an ice bath ready to go in case people um, do get too hot or what is the protocol for that. Um, and then make sure people are educated about it and what that looks like. So one of the ways that we, that we can also help is to monitor those environmental factors that play a role in heat stress. And so uh, the main way this is done is through what's called wet bulb globe temperature. Uh, and this is where we look at the dry temperature. So what's the temperature in the shade um, with kind of getting rid of not taking into account humidity? What's the radi radiation coming from direct sunlight? So it's literally a globe that's black and it, it sees how much heat's coming and kind of heating up the temperature and uh, from radiation from the sun. And then we look at... Um, the humidity and all that goes into equation to give us this uh, wet bulb globe temperature. And so what happens is when you get this number, there's a calculation when you take all those into account, uh, it lets us know that at different levels, what kind of is at risk. Um, and so less than 50 risk of hypothermia, so getting too cold, uh, at 50 to 65, kind of a neutral. And then as we get above 65, we start having moderate risk to heat illness. We have um, as we go even greater, extreme caution, so really likely for hypothermia to happen. Uh, and then eventually you get to a point where uh, the risk gets so high that really they don't want you exercising outside. And so you can get this information online or you can figure out how to measure that yourself. Um, and there are little charts that can walk you through this as well of how much time you should spend outside and how many breaks you can have. All of the high schools do this um, for their students, especially when it's um, in Georgia when we're at the beginning of a season and, and things are warmer and hotter and students aren't as conditioned. So that leads us into the opposite of heat, which is the cold, which is hypothermia, which is where your body temperature gets too low. Um, typically when you're looking at um, temperatures below 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the body, we start seeing those hypothermia symptoms. And as we continue to drop through that, you get things like shivering, uh, you get uh, heart slowing down and apathy and then eventually you can get so cold that you become unconscious and if your body temperature continues to drop um, basically you reduce blood flow to the brain stop breathing and eventual death so with cold um, basically this is where you're losing more heat than you can produce 
uh, through things like radiation, conduction, convection, just like we do with the heat. And so it was really important in the cold is to prevent heat loss. Um, I want to maintain that core temperature. And so there's lots of things that go into this with how much heat are we producing, our age and our sex, um, what kind of clothing are we wearing, is it dry, is it wet, and then the temperature outside and, and wind. Um, the greater, the, the lower the temperature is, the greater heat loss we'll have from the body. Um, but also when we're talking about water pressure, if the humidity is really low, we're more likely to evaporate sweat and that's going to lose more um, that's going to help us to lose more heat as well. The wind is one of the biggest things that uh, is a factor when it comes to cold stress. Uh, the higher the wind speed is, uh, the more heat is going to be removed from your body as it blows across your skin. And so this is called the wind chill. Um, and so the wind chill index takes into account temperature and how much the wind is to tell you what it actually may feel like outside and what's your likelihood of getting frostbite or um, heat too cold hypothermia is. Um, and then finally, the, the biggest thing, the absolute biggest thing that will cause you to lose heat uh, in a cold environment is water. When water comes in contact with the skin, it pulls heat away very quickly. And so heat loss is 25 times greater uh, in water than it is in air. So trying to stay dry and stay away from water in a cold environment is probably the most important. This is a chart that kind of shows you at uh, certain temperatures as the wind goes up how long it may take you to suffer frostbite. And so you can see even at um, a temperature of zero degrees Fahrenheit, a very calm wind makes it feel like negative 11. Still, we don't have too much to worry about, but um, at 10 degrees Fahrenheit, if the wind is at 50 miles an hour, uh, that could cause us to lose, um, uh, to suffer frostbite very quickly. Uh, and then at even colder temperatures, higher winds, it can take a matter of just a few minutes. And so it's something to kind of look at. Um, and so this is kind of showing us that the colder a water temperature is, even a fairly warm water at 60 degrees, I mean, that's cool, um, but it's not that cold of water. The exposure time uh, before death can occur uh, in hours, and it takes a little while, but as that drops, it can drop down into uh, mere minutes at the lower end of that to where water's almost freezing cold water. Uh, can knock someone out within a couple of minutes um, and cause death. This isn't unconsciousness. We're talking about actual death. Um, and so things to help with that is we do have subcutaneous fat that helps to hold our heat in. Really effective against cold water. Not something we can necessarily you say you need to build up, but it is helpful. Um, clothing plays a big factor. So cold clothing that is... Um, used for cold environments. They actually have a measurement. It's called a CLO unit or a CLO value, and this measures how insulating they are. Um, and so the higher number uh, CLO value, the more insulating it is, the better prevention at losing, the better it is at preventing heat loss. Um, again, dry clothes are more effective than wet. Um, and so you have to keep those things in mind. So really learn about clothing and how that plays a factor and how to layer properly if you're going to be in cold environments. Some of you may not. I live in Georgia. I don't experience too cold temperatures very often. Um, I realize when you exercise, the amount of insulation you need um, actually goes down because you're producing more heat, and you want to kind of balance that because if you get too warm, you're going to sweat more. That's going to cause your clothes to get wet, and when you stop exercise, could cause you to go into hypothermia. Uh, and so you can kind of see this CLO value that is needed depending on what work weight rate you're doing and the temperature outside. Um, so our heat production does increase as we're exposed to the cold. We shiver more. We also release hormones that help increase our metabolic rate to produce more uh, energy. We start to use more fats instead of carbohydrates, and so we do have all of this going on. Uh, one thing to note is that women tend to show a faster reduction in body temperature than men. Typically, that's associated with muscle mass. Um, but in water, they actually um, are about the same for men and women because the muscle mass isn't making that much of a difference because we're losing heat so quickly. Uh, also, older people are less tolerant to the cold and children are less tolerant. They lose body heat a little bit quicker as well, which I know we've talked about in another lecture.
Uh, biggest thing when you're dealing with hypothermia is um, you're going to see a loss in coordination, slurred speech, uh, impaired judgment. So really think drunk. They almost are acting drunk. Um, and so how we deal with that is you want to get them out of out of the cold situation, wind and rain, the cold, get wet clothing off. Uh, warm drinks maybe to some extent. There's some mixed feelings about that. Uh, but getting in dry clothing and then trying to slowly heat them back up, let them shiver, don't stop shivering. Um, uh, put the person in a sleeping bag that can hold that in. If you put another person in that bag, it can help. Uh, they can help heat that uh, bag up and then that heat transfers to them. Uh, getting near a heat source, but uh, really sometimes when you get too cold, you need to find a, immediate medical attention, especially if the person is, is losing consciousness. And so the last thing to talk about in this uh, particular lecture is air pollution. Uh, and so air pollution, the air that we breathe has a variety of different things in it. We think about the oxygen, the nitrogen, the CO2. There are also particles, dust particles, things coming from, you know, different sources that get into the air. And so air pollution has a detrimental effect on all of our health and performance when it comes to exercise. And so we want to try to... Uh, avoid this if possible, but we don't really have full control of the air pollution. But some places are better than others, and there are times where it's worse than others. Um, and so air pollution can actually decrease our ability to transport oxygen. Uh, they can increase the resistance in our airways uh, and just uh, alter how much effort it feels like it's taking us to do the same amount of effort. And so um, the the response that our body sees to this, this air pollution is really going to be dependent on the dose, short term, long term, how much of the air we're breathing in, um, and really like how long have you been there and how much are you breathing in and are you exercising in that. Uh, so during exercise, you're going to move more of that air, and so that, that res response may be more because you've seen more of those particles. Um, and so uh, air pollution can lead to things like infections in the lungs, uh, it can elevate your blood pressure and vasodilate. Uh, it can cause oxidative stress depending on what the particles are breathing in. Some aren't that harmless, while others can be quite harmful. Um, ozone, which typically we don't have at, we don't have a lot of it at uh, kind of living levels, but as we get higher and higher in elevation, ozone is O3 instead of O2, and it's not good for us. Uh, it can decrease VO2 max and cause respiratory dysfunction, uh, cause inflammation, which over long periods of time can be damaging to your body. Uh, things like sulfur dioxide, which is released from car exhaust, uh, can cause uh, your cause restriction in your airways, really bad for asthmatics. Carbon monoxide, which is also released from car exhaust, uh, actually competes with hemoglobin. Um, and uh, carbon monoxide wants to bind to hemoglobin more than oxygen does and will actually reduce your oxygen transport and cause you to have a lower VO2. So in a place with high air pollution, we can actually see very hindered performance. And this was a problem with the Olympics in Beijing. And so what you can see is that the higher levels of um, carbon dioxide that you're exposed to, the lower that, the higher that decrease in VO2 max is uh, into quite high percentages sometimes uh, so the biggest thing uh, when it comes to the, the air pollution is you want to reduce your exposure time um, because the less exposure you have, the less effects it's going to have. Um, and so try to, to exercise especially, but even just decrease your time spent in ways um, that are high trafficked areas, cities, urban areas, or places where there's factories that are producing a lot of these uh, air pollutants. Um, and then also there are time frames. So we know that uh, during kind of rush hour traffic, 7 to 10 or 4 to 7, when you want to avoid exercising at those times because air pollution is higher. Um, there are air quality indexes you can look at, and so uh, they're measuring these kind of five things that are going on. And so uh, try to find times and days to exercise, especially outside um, when it's lower. You can always exercise inside, and air quality tends to be a little bit better as long as proper filtration is occurring. And so you can kind of see uh, the recommendations depending on the, the levels and these very place to place and the weather that's going on. Believe it or not, rain actually helps to decrease this and so right after rain could be a good time where the air index is lower. And that kind of finishes this.
Um, hopefully you guys are doing well. Please let me know if you have any questions. And uh, yeah, we're almost through uh, all of our lectures.